Hello and welcome to Mr. Tompkins EdTech and my series of walkthroughs for the AQA GCSE Mathematics Pass Papers. This particular video is June 2018, Paper 1, Foundation Tier. Now, with the new specification being new, Grade 9 to 1 Pass Papers are like gold dust and you should not be watching this video unless you've already attempted the paper yourself under test-like conditions. If you haven't, stop the video now and go and do it first. I'm serious, go. Still watching? That's great. Why not subscribe to my channel so you can easily find it again the next time you want some help with your maths. I have plenty available content too, so make sure you come back and check that out if you're carrying on with your maths next year. Please hit the like button if you found the walkthrough helpful. This really helps out my channel and it makes it much easier for others to wade through all the YouTube dross and find the good stuff. Also, before attempting the actual past papers, make sure you've gone through all the practice sets first. AQA produced four sets of practice papers to help students prepare for the new GCSE exams, and I would advise you to work through these before moving on to the actual past papers. Have a look at this video series, which gives full walkthroughs for AQA practice sets one to four. If you don't happen to have a copy yourself, you'll find a download link to the practice paper in the description below each video. Finally, feel free to ask questions below. It would be helpful if you include a question number and be as specific as possible. I really appreciate your comments and feedback and I try to respond to these as quickly as I can, especially around exam times. Okay, let's get into it. Welcome along to another past paper walkthrough from Mr. Tompkins EdTech. Today we're going to be looking at the AQA GCC Maths Foundation Tier Paper 1. It was actually sat on the 24th of May 2018, although it does belong in the June set of papers. Okay, let's get cracking. Question 1. Work out half times 5. Okay, so normally when we want to try to try and find a fraction of a number, we would divide through by the number on the bottom and times through by the number on the top. Uh, but that doesn't give us a whole number here in that case because 2 doesn't divide into 5 nicely. Uh, as a alternative approach, I could rewrite 5 as 5 once and use the rules for fraction multiplication instead. Uh, so top times top equals 1 times 5, which is 5. Bottom times bottom is 2. So a half times 5 is the same thing as 5 halves. That's a improper fraction, isn't it? Now to rewrite that as a mixed number, you're looking at how many times 2 divides into 5. So what is 5 divided by 2? 5 divided by 2 is 2 remainder 1. So the answer is 2 because it goes in twice. The remainder is 1 and the divisor was 2, wasn't it? We divided by 2. So it's the same thing as 2 and 1 half. It's that one there. Question 2. Circle the number that is 5 less than minus 2. Well, the number 5 less than minus 2 is the same thing as asking what is negative 2 take away 5. So if we're already at negative 2 on the number line and we're going to subtract another 5, we're going 5 more jumps further in the negative direction. That's going to take me to negative 7. Question 3. Simplify 3 times a times 3 times a. Okay, uh, so what we want to do really is multiply like things with like things. So if I take that 3 and I multiply it by that 3, I'm going to get 9. And if I take my a and multiply it by my a, I'm going to get a times a is a squared. So I end up with 9a squared. 3 times 3 is 9, a times a is a squared, 9a squared, which is that one there. Question four, which shape is similar to shape X? Now, similar in mathematics has a very specific meaning. It means exactly the same shape, but one is an enlargement of the other. Okay, uh, so having a look at my four possibilities, you know, some are just clearly not right, are they? This one here, A, is clearly ridiculously stretched out, so it can't be that one. And similarly, B is very dumpy looking. I don't think it's going to be that one. So it's going to be C or D just by glancing at it. Uh, so if you measure this one on my kind of scale, it's got no digits on it, but you can see it's like six divisions from top to bottom. And it is uh, 
12 divisions from one point one point to the other so it's kind of half as tall as is wide isn't it it's 12 by 6 now if i look at c uh, that is so let me just make a note of that it was kind of six units that way 12 units that way now i'm not using a standard ruler here mine's kind of a digital one uh, but you could do it with your own ruler and use the mi the millimeters on your own ruler probably going to get a different answer to me but they, you should find that one is twice as big as the other and if we have a look at this one in this direction uh it is what's that oh uh 10 20 24 so it's about 24 in that direction uh and in the other direction that's around 12 so again that one is about twice as wide as is tall so i'm thinking it's probably c let's just double check d now if i check d that one is uh nine units from top to bottom and in the other direction that is 16 units so in that one, that one is not twice as big, is it? So I think it's going to be C because that one is in the same ratio as the one at the top and that one isn't. So it's going to be C. Question five, work out 20% of 14,000. Okay, so when you're finding a percentage of a number on a non-calculated paper, you're, you're, you're starting with 100%, aren't you? So 100% is everything, it's the 14,000. Uh, now, finding 10% is very easy. I could just divide my number by 10. So, dividing 14,000 by 10, that is 1,400. But we actually want 20%. Now, you can make 20% by taking two lots of 10%. Two lots of 10% is 20%. I'd have to do the same on this side, wouldn't I? If I was going to do that, though, so it balance. So, two 10% is 20%. And two lots of 1,400 is 2,800. So 20% of 14,000 is going to be 2,800. Question 6a. Write 0 0.85 as a fraction in its simplest form. Okay, now this number is given as a decimal. Uh, so, you know, if you think about the place values of numbers... Uh, the number before, the zero before the decimal point is units, isn't it? Now the eight lies in the tenths column and the five lies in the hundredths column. So actually another way of thinking about 0 0.85 is that you've got 85 one hundredths, uh, which I can write down as a fraction like that, 85 one hundredths. Now 85 ends in 5 and 100 ends in 0 and that's telling me I can divide them both by 5 they've got a common divisor there haven't they so if I can divide top and bottom by 5 then I'll take another look and see if there are any more uh, so 5's into 85 go 17 times and 5's into 100 go 20 times so 17 over 20 now, 17 is prime, isn't it? So I can't divide it down any more than that. It's going to be that. That's my answer in its lowest terms. 17 over 20. It's very windy today. Sorry if that's coming through on the microphone. 6b, right? 5 eighths as a decimal. Um, now, it's probably a good idea to remember what the eighths are because they're quite, quite common fractions to come up. But let's assume that you didn't remember what it was. You can do this like a division. Actually, 5 eighths is the same thing as 5 divided by 8. So I could write 8 as my divisor and 5 as the number I want to divide. I need some extra zeros here, I think. Uh, so I'm going to make it 5.0000. So 8 into 5 don't go. So kind of carry 5 over into the next column. Actually, maybe I'll write that a bit more spacey so i've got a bit more space to squeeze these extra numbers in space out a little bit more so uh so eights and five don't go eights into 50 then if i've got remainder five uh eight times table five eights of 46 eights of 48 aren't they so it goes in six times remainder two 
Okay, eight's into 20. Eight, 16, 24 is bust, isn't it? So it goes in twice. Remainder, eight times two is 16. Remainder is gonna be four then. And then finally, eights into 40. Uh, go five times, don't they? Exactly. So there is no remainder and I've got to the end of my decimal. So my decimal point started there. My decimal answer is gonna start uh, being the same place there. So the answer is 0 0.625. Having said that, I kind of knew it was 0 0.625 already before I did the calculation because it's a very common fraction and I do a lot of maths. It's kind of one that sticks in my head and it might be one that you just want to remember the decimal conversion to and from eights. Question seven, a rectangular carpet measures eight meters by six meters. Part of the carpet is covered by a square rug of length two meters. Show that one twelfth of the carpet is covered by the rug. Okay, so what do we need to do here? I think what we need to do is we need to find the area of the square and we need to find the area of the big rectangular carpet and then we need to express one as a fraction of the other. Okay, so the area of the square then is going to be, uh, well it's a square isn't it, so it's 2 by 2, 2 times 2, 2 squared, which is 4 meters squared, uh, and the area of the rectangle is going to be those two sides multiplied together, 8 times 6, 8 sixes are 48 square meters, okay, and then so what, expressing one as a fraction of the other then, so taking four and writing it as a fraction over 48. Uh, I can see that four and 48 are both in the four times table. So I can divide them both by four. So four divided by four is one, 48 divided by four is 12. So therefore, area of the square divided by area of the car, uh, rectangle is equal to 4 over 48, which is the same thing as 1 over 12. We're all done. Question 8. Sam, Carl and Eric share 40 sweets. Eric gets the largest share. What is the smallest possible number of sweets that Eric could get? So we've got Sam, Carl and Eric and all together their sweets add up to 40. Now it's a pity it wasn't the other way around because if it was uh, what's the largest number of sweets that Eric could get, he would get, well I'd give one to each of these guys and he'd get the rest to get 38 so that would be 40 sweets all together and Eric taking the largest amount but we're not doing that, we're doing the smallest amount so we need to find uh, giving sweets to Sam and Carl in such a way that Eric still gets the most, but uh, he gets the least most, if you see what I mean. Okay, so if we divided 40 equally by three, I know it doesn't go because 40 isn't in the three times table, but let's see what, what number would be close. 40 divided by three, what's that then? I know that uh, 10 threes are 30, uh, so 39 is 13 threes. So that is 13 remainder 1 then, isn't it? Okay, so what if we give each of them 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, and that remainder 1 we also give to Eric as well. So he gets the extra 1. In that way, he's got more than the other 2. Uh, but it is very close to them all getting the same amount. And I think that then is going to be the smallest possible number that Eric can get. Question nine, the time in Rio is three hours behind London. The time in New York is five hours behind London. What is the time in New York when it is 1 a.m. in Rio? Hmm, okay, so, I'm gonna use yellow. Uh, so in London then, we know that it is five hours behind in New York and we know that it is so that is five hours behind isn't it and then in Rio it's three hours behind so 
So that is minus 3. So then we can see from that that the distance in the times between New York and in Rio is going to be the difference between those two then, isn't it? So that is going to be, uh, Rio is going to be two hours, two hours ahead of New York, or New York is going to be two hours behind Rio. Okay, so if uh, it is 1 a.m. in Rio then, it's going to be two, hour, two hours be behind that in New York. So what is two hours before 1 a.m.? Uh, it'd be midnight, it'd be 11, 11 p.m., wouldn't it, the night before? So it's going to be 11 p.m. Question 10. Here is a list of numbers. Work out their median. Okay, now to find the median, you need to arrange the numbers from smallest to biggest and then find the number in the middle. Okay, so I'm going to do that first. Uh, I'm going to go through my list and rearrange it. So I've got a one. I've got two twos. I've got a three. I've got a four. I've got one, two, three fives. Five, five, five. I've got a six and I've got an eight. Okay, so I've rearranged them from smallest to biggest. Now, how many of them are there? There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten numbers altogether. So, ten numbers altogether. So, my middle one you can find by adding one and dividing by two. So, uh, your middle temp number is your ten plus one divided by two. Ten plus one is eleven divided by two. That tells me my median is going to be the 5.5th number or halfway between the fifth and the sixth number. So counting in, uh, one, two, three, four, five. That's my fifth number. That's my sixth number. So my median is going to be kind of halfway between those two numbers then, isn't it? So halfway between four and five is 4.5. Okay, so that's my median, 4.5. Uh, alternatively, if you don't like using this uh, n plus 1 over 2 way of working out where the median is, you can kind of come in from both ends. So you can kind of say uh, count in. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So I count in from both ends until you're just left with one or two numbers in the middle. Do it that way. That also works. Okay, 10b says work out the mean. So the mean is going to be all those numbers added up divided by the total number of numbers. Now, I already know that there are 10 numbers because I counted them earlier. Uh, but what do my numbers add up to? Uh, I've got 1, 2, 3, f I'm just going to add these up. 1, 3, 5, 8, 12, 17, 22, 27, 33, 41. So they add up to 41. Uh, there were 10 numbers altogether, so dividing 41 by 10 is move the decimal point one across it gives me 4.1 so my mean is 4.1 question 11 300 passengers go on a coach trip each coach takes 50 passengers each passenger pays 25 pounds the table shows the cost of for the coach company uh, cost for each coach is 90 pounds for the driver and 70p per mile for the fuel each coach travels 200 miles work out the total profit for the company uh, that they make on this trip okay so we've got doodles of information here we've got to just make sure that we use it all up in the right order okay so we want to work out the total profit now profit is um, the income that you've got coming in less your expenses uh, that you've got going out okay so we can try and work out those two things first work out the income work out the expenditure and then subtract one from the other and that will be the profit Okay, so I'm just going to write that down, that profit equals income minus expenditure. So let's work out the income first. So how much money have we got coming in? Uh, so we've got 300 passengers going on the trip. Each coach takes 50 passengers and each passenger pays 25 pounds. Okay, so we don't need the information about the the passengers yet, 50 passengers in a coach, but we do know that we need to know that we've got 300 passengers paying 25 pounds each. So that is our total income then, isn't it? That is going to be equal to 300 passengers paying
pay in £25 each. Okay, so what's 300 times 25? So what I can do is I can take those two zeros off there and put them on there instead and do three lots of 2,500, which would be 7,500. So I've got £7,500 coming in. Uh, and what is our expenditure then? So that is going to be, just write that properly. Uh, now what have we got then? So we've got each coach takes 50 passengers. How many coaches would we need? So our total number of coaches then is going to be our 300 passengers divided by our 50 per coach. So cancel that into that. 30 divided by 5 is 6. So we're going to need 6 coaches. So we want 6 coaches, not 1 coach. So if we've got 6 coaches, we're going to need 6 drivers. 6 nines are 54, so 6 nineties is going to be 540. Okay. Uh, and we are traveling. How far are we going? We're going 200 miles. So fuel per mile is 70p per mile. For fuel for 200 miles then, it's going to be 200 lots of 70p. I'm going to convert that 70p into pence. That's 0 0.7 pence, isn't it? Uh, so 200 times 0 0.7 uh, that is well, 200 lots of 70p. Uh, two lots of 70p are £1.40 times 100. That is going to be £14. No, £140, isn't it? So it's £140 per coach for the 200 miles at 70p a mile. Okay, so but we've got six coaches, so 140 times six. What's that? So that's zero. Four six is a 24. Okay, two one six is six plus two is eight. That's 840. So it's going to cost us 840 pounds in fuel. So then the total cost is going to be those two things added together. So it's going to be 540 plus 840. 540 is the cost for your six drivers, and 840 is the cost of all the fuel. So adding those up, uh, 840 and 540, 08. Uh, 13, 1,380. So then the profit is going to be our income, 7,500 pounds minus our expenditure of 1,380 pounds. So zero, can't do that, got to borrow one. So that's four, that becomes 10, 10 subtract. 8 is 2, 4 subtract 3 is 1, and 7 subtract 1 is 6. So the profit then is £6,120. Okay. 12a, work out 16.4 minus 3.92 plus 7.8. Okay, so I've got two operations to perform here. I need to do the subtraction and the addition. And actually, I could add the 6.4 and the 7.8 together first and then do the subtraction. Or I can subtract 3.92 from 16.4 and add on 7.8. It doesn't really make any difference. I think I'm going to start with the subtraction. Seems most logical. 16.4 subtract 3.92. Just going to pad that out with an extra zero to make the subtraction go a bit easier. Uh, so, zero takeaway two, I can't do. You're going to borrow one from there, and that makes it 10. Uh, 10 subtract two is eight. Uh, three subtract nine, I can't do. So, again, going to borrow one from there, that makes it 13. 13 subtract nine is four. 
five, subtract three is two, and one, subtract nothing is one. So I get £12.48 after the subtraction. Now I need to add on 7.8, so I'm just going to continue from here. I'm just going to write plus and put the 7.8 here. Just being careful to line it up in the right place. Decimal point below decimal point. And you can see I've padded it out again with an extra zero, just so I've got the, the right number of columns. Uh, now we're doing addition this time, so 8 plus 0 is 8. 4 plus 8 is 12, so I'm going to write the 2 here and I'm going to carry 1 to the next column. Uh, 2 and 7 makes 9, plus 1 is 10. So I'm going to put the 0 here and carry 1 into the next column. And then I've got 1 plus 1, which is 2. Now my decimal point was here and here, and it's going to be here in my answer. 20.28. Twelve B work out two thousand eight hundred and forty three point six one divided by seven. Okay, I'm going to do this because the divisor is small. It's a, a single digit number. I'm going to just use short division to do this. Uh, so I'm going to write my seven on the outside, and then my two eight four three point six one along there. Now you notice I've written them with nice lots of space in between because I know I'm going to have remainders to to squeeze in. So if you write your numbers down with a bit of space, and it doesn't get too crowded as you go through. Okay, so let's do the division. Then 7 goes into 2, it doesn't go. 7 into 28, uh, 7, 14, 21, 28 goes in 4 times exactly. Remainder 0. Uh, so 7s into 4 don't go, so that goes in 0 times. Uh, remainder all of those 4. 7s into 43, well, 6 7s are 42, so it goes in 6 times, remainder 1. So I'm going to write a little 1 there. 7s into 16, that goes how many times? 7s into 16 goes twice. Uh, so twice, oops, let's do the right colour, twice uh, and remainder 2. And then finally, 7s into 21 go three times, remain to zero. Okay, so we're all done. Uh, now, the, the decimal point was here, so my decimal point is going to be in the same place here. It's going to be 406.23. 406.23. Question 13. In a game, two fair spinners are spun. If the numbers the arrow lands on are different, the score is the higher number, and if the number the, la the arrow lands on are the same, then the score is zero. Complete the table to show the possible scores. So if they are different, it's the highest number, and if they're the same, it's zero. Okay, so we've got the numbers for spinner A along one side and B along the other. So if I get 1 on spinner A and 2 on spinner B, then it's the higher one. The difference is going to be the higher one of the two. It's going to be 2. If I get 1 on A and 3 on B, it's going to be the higher one. And if it's 1 on A and 5 on B, it's going to be the higher one. So it's 2, 2, 3, 5. Okay? So if I get 2 on spinner A and 2 on spinner B, then they're the same, so it's 0. If I get 2 on A and 3 on B, it's the higher one, so it's 3. And if it's 2 and 5, then it's going to be the higher one. It's 5. Okay, for the next row, 4 on spinner A. If it's 2 on spinner B, then 4 is higher, so I'm going to get 4. If it's 4 and 2, then 4 is higher. If it's 4 and 3, then 4 is higher. And if it's 4 and 5, then 5 is higher. And then the final row, 6 on spinner A. 6 is higher than 2, so it's 6. 6 is higher than 2, so it's 6. 6 is higher than 3, so it's 6. And 6 is higher than 5, so it's 6. Okay, so that's my completed table. Write down the probability that the score is an odd number. Okay, well, probability is defined to be successful outcomes divided by total outcomes. Now here, the total number of outcomes 
were uh, each of the cells that I've got in my possibility space. We've got four results on A and four results on B. Four times four give me a square of size 16. So there are 16 possible outcomes altogether. We want the possibilities that are odd numbers. Okay, so which one of these answers are odd? Uh, three is odd. Three is odd. Five is odd. Five is odd. Five is odd. Okay, so four is definitely not odd, and six isn't, and two isn't. What about zero? Is zero an odd number? Well, in fact, zero is a quite curious number. It doesn't really have a... Uh, it's neither odd nor even, I think. Uh, so, anyway, we've got five odd numbers. So the answer is five out of a total of 16. Five sixteenths is the answer. Okay, now the last part says the same game is played using spinners C and D. The numbers on C are shown. The table shows some of the possible scores. Okay, what numbers are missing? Okay. Well, let's work it out from the table first. So if uh, I got one on spinner C and I don't know what I got on spinner D, but the answer was four. Well, I, I know I've got, I must have got a four then on spinner D. Looking at this answer here, if I got one on spinner C, then I must have got four on uh, on spinner D at that point there, because uh, four is bigger than one, so it would be the four that we accepted. Now, if I got a zero here, uh, that means the numbers must have been the same, so it must have been a four there. Okay. Uh, and in my next row, I, f I see if I got a seven there, and in the end it was a zero, then I must have had a seven up there. So seven and seven makes zero. And then finally, I've got eight down here, haven't I? So if I've got seven on one spinner, and, but my final answer was eight, it must have been an eight up here. So write the missing numbers on spinner D. We haven't done that yet. Spinner D is up here. So it should be four, four, seven, eight. Question 14. Two people working at the same rate will take six hours to paint a room. 14a says, assume that they all work at the same rate. How long will it take three people to paint the room? Hmm. Okay, so let's have a think about this. I've got two people Uh, and they're painting for six hours to do the room. So that means that altogether two times six is 12. So it takes 12 people hours to work, to paint the room. Okay, so then if I increase my number of people to three people, I've not increased the amount of work that needs to be done. It's still gonna be 12 people hours to paint the room but i've got three people to do it with now so if i take my 12 people hours and i divide it by my three people that leaves me with four hours okay so it's going to take my three people four hours to, to paint the room room just make sure that i'm answering the right question how long will it take three people to paint the room it will take them four hours okay in fact the third person works at a faster rate. How does this affect the time to paint the room? Okay, so let's have a think about this. So we're assuming that uh, each of these three people paint the same rate, and that gave us the answer of four hours. But this is a super, super fast person who can paint more than uh, his due lot. So actually what I'm doing is I'm increasing this divisor slightly. Let's say he can, he can work the same rate as one and a half people. Then I've got three and a half people working on the job. So 12 divided by a slightly larger number is going to give me a slightly smaller finish time. So the amount of time it's going to take to finish the room is going to go down a little bit. It's going to decrease. 
So how does this affect the time to paint the room? The time will decrease. Question 15, 3a plus b equals 7 and 6x plus 8y is equal to 40. Show that 9a plus 3b has a greater value than 3x plus 4y. Well, we know that 3a plus b is equal to 7. So what is 9a plus 3b equal to? Well, I don't know if you can notice, but uh, 9a is 3 times bigger than 3a. And 3b is 3 times bigger than b. So this number here is going to have to be 3 times bigger than that one there, isn't it? So 7 3s then are going to be 21. So 9a plus 3b is going to have to be 21. Okay, let's have a look at the other one. Uh, we were told that 6x plus 8y was 40. And we now want to know about 3x plus 4y, what that is equal to. Now again, notice here, look, I've got 6x here and 3x here, which is exactly half. I've got 8y here and 4y here, which is exactly half. So then this one here is going to have to be halved again, isn't it? So if I'm dividing by 2, that's the same thing as halving, isn't it? 6x divided by 2 is 3x, 8y divided by 2 is 4y, so 40 divided by 2 gives me 20. So we can see that 9a plus 3b is 21, and 3x plus 4y is equal to 20, so 9a plus 3b is greater than 3x plus 4y. Okay, we've done it. Circle the point that lies on the line x minus 3 is equal to 0. Okay. It's been given a bit of a weird form here. If I add 3 to both sides on this equation, then I'm going to get... Well, those two things are going to cancel out, aren't they? And it's just going to leave me with x equals 3. So this is the line x is equal to 3. Uh, any line of the form x is equal to number is going to be a vertical line through that number. So it's going to be like a straight line passing through 3. Um, now any point along that line is going to have an x coordinate of 3 and then the y coordinate, whatever it happens to be. So uh, that point there must lay on this line. Question 17. A is a negative odd number. Circle the words that describe a squared. Okay, so a is a negative odd number. Sometimes it's helpful to give some examples of that. So if a is a negative number and it's odd, it could be something like minus 3 or minus 5 or minus 9, something like that. Okay, so circle the words that describe a squared. So if I took those numbers, minus 3, minus 5, minus 9, and I times them by themselves, then negative 3 times negative 3, 3 times 3 is 9, and a negative times a negative is positive, so that's positive 9. Uh, negative 5 times itself would be positive 25, and negative 9 times itself would be positive 81. Okay? So circle the words that describe each of these answers. So, they're, so the ones that I got ended up being positive and odd, didn't they? Because... A negative times a negative is a positive, so any number I pick, which is negative, and square, I'm going to get a positive number. And they all ended up being odd, and that's no coincidence either, because if you take any odd number and you times it by an odd number, you get an odd number. So it doesn't matter what my value of a was, if it started out being negative and odd, and I square it, I'm going to end up with a positive and odd solution. It's that one. Question 18, circle the ratio which is the same as the scale one centimetre represents one kilometre. Hmm, one centimetre is one kilometre, okay? Well, I know that there are a thousand metres in a kilometre. So what's that then? So one centimetre then is the same thing as one thousand metres. And I know that there are 
a hundred centimeters in one meter. So a thousand meters is going to be a thousand lots of a hundred centimeters. So this scale, so I shouldn't really have dot equal signs in it, they're a ratio, aren't they? Uh, so one centimeter goes with well, let's times that by a hundred. Let's add in another two zeros. In it? so it's one and then one, two, three zeros I already had plus another two zeros uh, centimeters. So what's that? That's a hundred thousand centimeters, isn't it? So one centimeter to a hundred thousand centimeters is the scale. It's that one on the end. Question nineteen. Circle the percentage that is closest in value to one third. Okay. Now one third, one third, one third of a whole number is one third. One third of a hundred percent. What's one third of a hundred percent? One hundred divided by three. Three is into one hundred. Go thirty-three point three 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 times, don't they? Okay, it's that one with a, a dot on the top. Thirty point three point three with a dot on the top. So that is going to be your percentage. One third is going to be the equivalent to 33.3 reoccurring. So which one of my answers is closest to that? It's going to be out of these two here. It's certainly not going to be these two. It's going to be closest to one of these two. Or which one? Is 33.3333 bigger to 33.3 or 33.4? Well, if I've got 33.3333 and I want to round it off to one, decimal place. I'm going to be rounding off after that number. The very next digit is a 3, which means I would need to round down. So it rounds off or is closest to 33.3. .3. Question 20. Work out root 121 minus 13 minus 5 times 2 all squared. Okay, so ooh, I'm going to have bid mass going on here, aren't I? Brackets indices, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. That tells you the order that you need to do things. Okay, so first up, brackets got to deal with this bit in here. Now the bit in there has got two operations going on as well. It's got a multiply and a subtraction. So just as having a little mini bid mass competition out of those two, I need to do the multiplying before I do the subtraction. Okay, so working this through, I'm just going to leave everything as it is until I get to that point in bid mass. Okay, and then I'm going to do that bit. So I've got 13 minus 5 times 2. I'm going to do the multiplying first. So that gives me 13 minus 5 times 2 is 10. And then I'm going to do the subtraction. So that is equal to root 1, 2, 1 minus 13. Subtract 10 is 3. So it's 3 squared. Right, so next up is indices. Okay, now I've got two indices to do here. I've got this one, my three squared, but this is also an index as well, uh, this root sign. They have the same weight as well, so I've got to do those next. So what is the square root of 121? Well, 11 times 11 is 121, so the square root of 121 is 11. Uh, minus... 3 squared. 3 squared is 9. Okay, so now I've just got uh, subtraction left to do. It's very simple. Got to uh, subtract one of those from the other. 11 subtract 9 is 2. Okay, answer is 2. Looked horrible, but as long as you follow the, the rules of bid mass carefully, you'll get the right answer. Question 21. Uh, part A says reflect the triangle in the line x equals 2. Okay, so we've got a triangle here. What does the equation x equals 2 look like, or the line x equals 2 look like? Um, we talked about this earlier. Any line that is of the form x is equal to number is going to be a vertical line through that value. So the line x is equal to 2 is this one here. I'm just going to draw it on in green. So that's my mirror line. So I want to reflect it in that line. Okay. Uh, so when I do a reflection, I like to take each point in turn, work how far away it is from the mirror line. So that's one unit away. So its image is going to be one unit away on the opposite side there. Uh, this point down here, again, that's one unit away from the mirror line. So its image is going to be one unit on the other side. It's going to be there. And then finally, I've got this point here. Now that is one, two, three units away from the mirror line. 
So it's image is going to be one, two, three units away. It's going to be there. Once I've got all the points, I can join them all up to make my shape. So there. Okay, there we go. All done. Question 21b says, rotate the kite 90 degrees anti-clockwise about zero, zero. Okay, so the point of rotation is given as this point here. That's my point of rotation. And anti-clockwise is the opposite way that the clock is going. It's this way around. You've always got a clock in your um, exam room to have a look at. So if you can't remember, just have a look at the clock and work backwards. So it's that way around, okay? So we're gonna take each point and rotate it. Now, you might find it easy to do with uh, tracing paper. So what you can do is trace the four points, then stick your pen tip where the center of in, uh, rotation is and then turn it around 90 degrees. That's one way of doing it. Or you can take each one of the points and just think it through. Uh, so that point there is gonna kind of rotate around to there uh that point there is I, I kind of think in night moves so if you're looking at this point here it's one two three units down and one two across from the center of enlargement sorry from the center of rotation so rotating that kind of l shape round is going to be one two three one two it's going to be up there okay uh this point down here is one, two, three, four units directly below. So it's gonna end up over there, four units to the right. And finally, this point over here is one to the left and three down. So it's gonna be two down and three to the right. It's gonna be here. Okay, once you've got your four corners, again, it's just a matter of joining them up then with a ruler. Okay, it's always good just to do a visual inspection at the end. You know, these transformations are not going to change the, the overall shape. So if your object and image look different, then you've probably made a mistake. It's not going to squish it or stretch it in any way. They're going to look like uh, identical congruent shapes that you've just shifted around the page a little bit. Question 22, Anna plays a computer game. Each game is a win or a loss. She wins three quarters of her first 24 games. She then wins her next 12 games. For all 36 games, work out the ratio of wins to losses. Give your answer in its simplest form. Okay, so she wins three quarters of her first 24 games. So what is three quarters of 24 then? So again, we talked about this earlier. The fact if you want to find a fraction of a number, you divide through by the denominator and you times through by the numerator. So 24 divided by four is six. Four goes into 24 six times. So that's the same thing as three times six. And then three times six is 18. Okay, so she wins three quarters of her first 24 games. So that is 18 wins. And how many losses? So if she won 18 out of 24, that was gonna be six losses, isn't it? 18 wins, six losses for those 24 games. Okay, she then wins her next 12 games. So that's 12 wins. Uh, so all 36 games work out the ratio of wins to losses. So wins to losses. Uh, we said she, she won 18 of the first 24 plus another 12. That gives us her total of 30 wins. And her losses were 6, so 30 to 6. Okay, now it wants it in the simplest form. That is not the simplest form because 30 and 6 have a common divisor. Uh, they're both in the 6 times table, so dividing by 6. 30 divided by 6 is 5, and 6 divided by 6 is 1. So the ratio in its simplest form is 5 to 1. 
five to one. Question 23, a solid shape is made from centimeters cubes. Here is the plan, side elevation and front elevation of the shape. Uh, centimeter cubes are added to make this cuboid. How many cubes are added? Okay, so can we piece it together what we've got to, uh, to start with? So the plan is the view from above, isn't it? Okay, so when we're looking from above, it looks like an L shape. Uh, from the front, it looks like a solid block. And from the side, it looks like that. Okay. Now I need to make a block which is 4 by 4 by 3. I'm going to use the plan. I'm going to build up from it. Okay, so let's have a look at the plan. Uh, these three blocks here, uh, if I'm looking from the front elevation, I can see that I've got four blocks in, on top of each other. So there are already four blocks piled up here, here, and here. Okay, because I'll be looking at it from the front. Uh, I can see that that's four, and they're four. So they're going to have four, four, four in that plan. Now the next square here, here look, that's going to be this row. So there are actually one, two, three blocks piled up there. So they're going to be three blocks already there. And then the next two rows here and here are going to be this one and this one. So they're going to have two blocks and two blocks in each of those. And then obviously I've got no blocks here, 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 here and here. Okay, so to build this up to a cuboid, which is four by four by three, I'm gonna to have to top up each one of these columns from above, so they're all equal to four. So I'm gonna to have to add on, uh, for each of these, I'm gonna to have to add four to each of those. Four times six is gonna be 24 blocks that go in there. Okay, these ones are all fine. Uh, this one here, I'm going to have to add an extra one to, to make four blocks. And then these two, I'm going to have to add two to each. So I'm going to have to add two and two. So that gives me a total of 29, 29 blocks to add to top that all up. So, how many cubes are added? I'm going to be adding 29 cubes. Question 24. Divide 405 in the ratio of 4 to 11. So if I want to rate, divide in the ratio of 4 to 11, uh, I've got 4 parts to 11 parts, which is 4 plus 11. That's 15 parts altogether. Okay, so if I then divide 405 by my 15 parts, it should tell me what the value of each part is worth then. So 15s in the 4 don't go. 15 into 40 go twice. Uh, two 15s are 30. So that rem re gives me a remainder of 10. Uh, so 105. 15s into 105 go uh, 7 times. So that is 27. So each part is worth 27. So if I take my ratio of 4 to 11 and I scale it up by a factor of 27, 4 27s times it by 4 is doubling and doubling again. So 27 doubled is 54, doubled again is 100 and 108. And then 11 times 27. 10 27s is going to be 270. So add another 27 to that. That's 297. 297. Uh, we can just double check. I've got the right answer by adding those two up. Make sure I've still got 405. 7 9s is 5. Carry 1. That's 0. Yeah, 405. It does work. So I'm going to have 108 and 297. So the height of Zach is 1.86 meters. He's a big boy. And height of Fred is 1.6 meters. Write the height of Zach as a fraction of the height of Fred. Give your answer in its simplest form. 
write the height of the of Zach as a fraction of the height of Fred. That means Zach's height goes on the top and Fred's height goes on the bottom. So it's going to be 1.86 divided by 1.6. Now again, we've got decimals here, which we can easily get rid of by multiplying top and bottom by... Well, let's do it by 100. Uh, so what will that, what that give me? That will give me 186 over 160, won't it? So it's a top-heavy fraction. Uh, right, so we're looking for common divisors now. 160 and 186. Well, struggling to find a common divisor. Uh, bigger than 2, let's just halve it and see. have another look. So that would be 93 over 80. Okay, any common factors there again? 3, no. 7, no. No, I can't think of any more. No, I think that's about as far as I'm going to get with cancelling down. Now it's asking for the simplest form here, so we cancel down as far as we can. Uh, now we could write it as a mixed number, we could write it as 1 and 13 over 80. Uh, but I don't actually think that is any more simple than this. I prefer to leave my answers as top heavy fractions, I think they're more useful, so I'm going to leave it like that. The point A, which has coordinates 0, 2, and the point B, which has coordinates 6, 5, are points on the straight line A, B, C, D. Uh, we're told that AB is equal to BC, which is equal to CD. Uh, so let's just mark that on the diagram. So these are all the same length, aren't they? These three sections. Uh, work out the coordinates of D. Okay. Right, so we know A, coordinate A and we know coordinate B. So we can work out how far in that direction and how far in that direction is between those two points. So having a look at the X coordinates... Uh, 0 to 6 tells me that the distance in the direction of x is 6 and looking at the y coordinates 2 and 5 tells me that the distance in the y coordinates 5 subtract 2 is 3 so from a to b we're going 6 units along and we're going to go 3 units up okay now we want to work out the coordinates of d so we can either work out C along the way by going 6 along and 3 up and another 6 along and 3 up, or we can double that up and go 12 along and 6 up. Okay, I'm going to do it in one jump because I'm a bit lazy. Don't want to do things twice. So 12 along and 6 up from B. So B has coordinates 6, 5. So if I go an extra 12 along in the direction of X, then 6 plus 12 is 18. And if I go, I'm at 5 in the direction of y. And if I go up another 6, then that's going to be 5 plus 6. That's going to be 11 up. OK, giving me a coordinates 18, 11 for d. Okay, as I said, I could have done it in two jumps gone by c, but 18, 11. I think that's a slightly quicker way of doing it. A coin is thrown 50 times, it lands on heads 31 times. Write down the relative frequency it lands on heads. Okay, well, relative frequency is defined to be successful trials. Tri successful meaning it, the thing that you're looking for happens. Uh, divided by total trials, so how many times you tried it all together. So successful trials over total trials. So here, it landed on heads 31 times. So in, in terms of this problem, we had 31 successes and we had 50 trials altogether. So the relative frequency is 31 over 50. Uh, don't be under any pressure to simplify probability questions. You never get any more marks for it. You just might as well leave it as it is. I don't, I'm not actually sure you can cancel it down, can you? Anyway, let's move on. Uh, 8b, Raj says the coin is biased towards heads. Use the data to give a reason why he might be correct. Okay, well, we've got 31 out of 50 trials that were uh, were heads, which is a bit more than we, you would expect, wouldn't you? Uh, the theoretical probability of getting heads 
is a half so the expected uh, successes would have been a half times 50 or 25 uh, and he's reporting 31 here okay so we would expect 25 but uh, he got 31 okay so that is some evidence to suggest it might be biased. It might just be a lucky break though. Not that far off 25, is it? But anyway, that's what we can write down. Solve five lots of X plus three uh, is less than 60. So this is an inequality. Uh, now you can just solve these exactly the same way you would an equation. Uh, so as long as you can solve equations, you can also solve inequalities, mostly. There is one extra rule, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so 5 lots of x plus 3 is less than 60. Uh, I can simplify both sides by dividing through by 5. So dividing the left hand side by 5, that's going to cancel with that. It's going to leave me with x plus 3 is less than. And then 60 divided by 5 is 12. And then subtracting 3 from both sides, then I'm going to be left with x is less than nine okay so like i say you can you can solve these exactly as you would an equation just one thing to be uh careful of is dividing through by negative numbers because that has that flips the sign around if you do that so either avoid dividing by through by negative numbers or remember that if you do you'll have to flip the inequality sign around the other way the range of a set of numbers is 15 and a quarter the smallest number is negative two and seven eighths work out the largest number. So range, if you remember, is defined to be the largest value minus the smallest. So if we rearrange that, move that over there, look, then the largest value is going to be the range plus the smallest, isn't it? So I'm gonna find it by adding my two fractions together. So in this case, it's going to be my range, which is 15 and a quarter, plus my negative 2 and 7 eighths. And now adding a negative is the same thing as taking away. So that is the same thing as those two things subtracted from each other. I'm just going to write them as top heavy fractions now as well. Should I do that? Yeah, let's do that. So 15 fours are 60, plus 1 is 61 quarters. So I've got 61 quarters minus 2 eighths are 16 plus 7 are 23. So 23 eighths. Okay, so subtraction, I need a common denominator. So just doubling up those two numbers there. So we change it into an equivalent fraction over 8. So 61 times 2 is 122 eighths. So 122 eighths minus 23 eighths. Uh, so subtracted numerators that's going to give me 99 over 8 uh, do we have to give it in a certain form it just says work out the largest number I've got 99 over 8 should I write as a mixed number well 8 into 99 go 12 times don't they 12 8 are 96 that goes in 12 times remainder 3 so it's 12 and 3 8 Again, I think 99 over 8 is probably a more useful number to deal with and would still get you all the marks, I think. Uh, doesn't say right as a mixed number, but either of those will get you the three marks. Y is inversely proportional to X. Complete the table. Okay, so Y is inversely proportional to X. That means Y is inversely proportional, little fishy, over 1 over x okay so that's what that is saying mathematically now we can replace the little fishy symbol with equals k uh, so i'm going to rewrite that so y equals k over x where k is a constant that we can then find okay now you can find the constant k if you've got two values uh well your value of x and your value of y that go together now we've got one of those in the table 
if we look at this table, I've got two numbers here that go together. When x when x is 6, y is equal to 4. So sub in x equals 6, y is equal to 4 into my partial equation, y equals k over x. I should be able to find out what k is. So uh, that becomes 4 equals k over 6, replacing y for 4 and x for 6. Okay, then just taking that 6 there, cross multiplying up there, or multiplying both sides by 6 if you'd rather, I'm going to get k is equal to 24, aren't I? Okay, so my complete equation then is going to be y equals k, which we've now found to be 24, over x. Okay, so now this is my complete equation, which I can then go and find my other values. So if x equals 12, then y is 24 over x. y is 24 over 12. 24 divided by 12 is 2. So when x is 12, y is 2. Uh, and what about the other way around? So if y is 8, what is x? Okay, so if 8 is equal to 24 over x, uh, just cross multiplying these two, just switching them around, I'm going to get x equals 24 over 8. 24 divided by 8 is 3. So x is 3 when y is 8. Once you've done a few of these uh, proportional questions, they get very, very formulaic. They always give you, they always start off by giving you the rule that um, links y and x. You can then form your partial equation, uh, which involves the constant uh, k. Uh, and then you'll have a pair of values that you can sub in to find what k is to complete the equation and then you can go on and use your complete equation to find other values. They're always the same, very, very formulaic questions and after you've done a few, you should be good on them. A large rectangle is made up by joining three identical small rectangles as shown. Now, it's not drawn accurately, so don't get your ruler out. Uh, we're told that the perimeter of one small rectangle is 15. Work out the perimeter of the large rectangle. Hmm. This looks like a job for algebra. Now let's say that the width of one of these rectangles is W. Now I could write L there for the length, but actually, if you look at it, this length here, is the same thing as this and this together. In other words, we've got a, a rectangle which has got sides W and 2W. So I only need one unknown for this rectangle, not two. So I've got a, a rectangle with sides W and 2W. So then its perimeter is going to be those four sides added together. So my 2w plus my w plus my 2w plus my w going around the, shirt, uh, the rectangle 2w w 2w 2w uh, so how many w's is that then that's six w's all together and we're told that the perimeter of the small rectangle is 15 so we can replace the p there with the 15 and that tells me that 6w is equal to 15 so dividing both sides by 6 I'm going to get w equals 15 over 6. So 6 goes into 15 twice, remainder 3. So w is 2 and 3, 6, or, or 2 and a half, isn't it? 2 and a half. Now, the question actually wants us to work out the perimeter of the large rectangle. So if we come back to our diagram then, then our large rectangle is going to be from here to here is three w's, isn't it? It's two w and a w, which is three w's. And then down here is two w's. So it's three w, two w, three w, two w, which is uh, 10 w, isn't it? So the perimeter of large rectangle equals 10 w which is equal to that's well, 25 so the answer is 25 centimeters
put these numbers in order from smallest to largest. Okay, and I've got some numbers that are written in standard form. They've got negative indices, so they're kind of decimal numbers, aren't they? Okay, so I've got 8 times 10 to the minus 4. Let's just write that as a decimal. That's going to be 0 0.0008. Okay, if it's minus 4, I'm writing four zeros. 0 0.0008. Uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 2. Again, I've got minus 2, so we're going to write 2, 0, 0, 0 and then put the 4 in. Uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 4, going to write 4 zeros, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and then the 6, and then I've got my number there, 0 0.07 on the end. Okay, now these numbers have got different number of digits. Sometimes it's handy just to kind of pad them out so they're easier to compare. Uh, and then you can kind of compare them like numbers. So I've got 6, 8, 400, and 700. It makes them very easy to compare. Uh, so the smallest then is going to be... This one, so I'm going to write that one first. Then my next biggest is going to be this one. Uh, my next biggest is going to be this one. And my largest one is this one. Okay. Now I'm going to put them in order and I'm going to write down the numbers that I was actually given because they're the ones I was asked to compare. So my smallest is 6 times 10 to the minus 4. My next biggest is 8 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, my next biggest is... 4 times 10 to the minus 2, and then finally I've got 0 0.07. So that's all, we've reached the end of the paper. How did you do? Let me know in the comments below, along with any questions you still might have. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this walkthrough helpful. If you didn't do so well, try revising around the topics you're struggling with before attempting another past paper. Good luck with your preparations and in your exams and see you again next time.